Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this microphone, by the way, is, does not amplify. It just apparently picks us up for the gentleman back there. I just mentioned that to the panel, so we'll all have to speak up. Well, I want to welcome you to the International Law Institute, of which I'm chairman, and you are now here. I'm not going to tell you much about it, but there are brochures everywhere. We're a large sort of rule of law training capacity building operation. Um, I'm very happy you're here. I'm very happy that the ILI can be your host. Normally, these programs are run over at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, whose chairman of the Board of Regions is the far end, General Gray, and you will hear from him at the end. Um, and we're very happy, of course, to sponsor these programs with Yona. I think most of you know him. Uh, our topic, you, I think you all have the program, you should. Um, it's the fog of war, is the rule of law still relevant? I guess the problem, it's really sort of the fog of the law of war, which is a problem as much as the fog of war. Uh, and you're going to hear a great deal from this very accomplished and distinguished panel. Um, we're talking about international law. We're not talking about the Constitution, although you may realize that with respect to ISIS, there are constitutional issues as well. Uh, and Ken Anderson and Nick and David and the others will, t and Tony will tell you a lot more about this than I, but in the broad, we want to distinguish between, and I never took Latin to the fury of my father, um, between what is called jus ad bellum, how do you get into a war? Is a war just? That's kind of United Nations charter law, such as it is. Uh, and then the conduct of law, and that's jus in, in bello, and that's kind of Geneva Conventions and stuff like this. And I don't quite know what our intentions are, whether we're going to focus on the latter, which is the law of armed conflict, which has rules like necessity, proportionality, distinction, or they will slop up into the UN rather decrepit system of international law. That's essentially our, the program today. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Yona Alexander, and he will tell you a bit about, more about the program, the challenges, and about the speakers. So again, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Don. <clears throat> Whenever Don speaks, he always triggers, I think, uh, some uh, analytical, you know, questions or semantical definitional questions <coughs> about the fog of, of war and the fog of law. Uh, let's compromise. Uh, you have a fog, both related to the law and uh, to war. But at any rate, we'll deal with that. I, I have uh, basically uh, four uh, brief uh, comments, if I may, before we uh, move on with our distinguished panel. One, one is uh, the uh, housekeeping uh, duties uh, that I have. And uh, may, may I suggest that you kindly turn off this little toy because uh, we don't want to be interrupted with uh, music. Um, number two, I, I would like to uh, thank, uh, obviously, our co-sponsors and uh, Don and the International Law Institute for uh, providing uh, the forum and cooperation for many, many, many years, and, of course, the Potomac uh, Institute <coughs> that is involved in our activities for many, many years. And uh, we are delighted, obviously, uh, to have uh, General Gray, uh, who is the chairman of uh, the Board of Regents. Um, and we'll introduce uh, the panel in a minute. I, I would like also to recognize the contribution to uh, our work for a very long time, the Center for National Security Law, the University of Virginia School of Law. Um, my colleagues are not present now, but they participate in our work and they are great supporters. So let me first uh, introduce uh, the panel. Uh, to, to my right uh, here is uh, Professor David Kaplow. You have a bios of each and every one so I'm not going to go uh, into uh, detail, but at any rate, he's currently a professor of law at uh, Georgetown University, and uh, he will open up later on 
Uh, following him is Professor Nick Rastow, who uh, is uh, currently a senior uh, fellow and director, senior director at the Institute for National Strategic <coughs> Studies at the National Defense University. Uh, then is some um, uh, Saliba, who is a senior fellow or senior foreign law specialist for the Middle East and North Africa at the Law Library of Congress. <coughs> Next to him is Professor Tony Arendt, who is currently a uh, professor at uh, Georgetown uh, Foreign Service, professor of government, and uh, director of the Master of Science of Foreign Service at the Foreign Service Institute. And then uh, we have Professor Ken Anderson, who is um, a professor at the Washington College of Law. And last but not least, of course, General Al Gray. Um, I always um, introduce him as the great American, but uh, we are, all of us are in debt to his many contributions to national security. And uh, currently is also the chairman of the board, as I mentioned, of regions of the Potomac. I also would like to welcome um, our uh, audience and um, if I may, I would like to say a few words about the so-called geostrategic environment to remind all of us what are we talking about um, when we talk about the fog of law or uh, conflict. And of course, we're, we're talking about specifically the complex and the unpredictable I think strategic environment. Uh, I'm, I mentioned here, uh, for example, the uh, situation uh, in North Africa, in the Maghreb, in the Sahel, and Sub-Sahara, uh, simply because we did a lot of work uh, in this particular area, and sometimes this area is forgotten. We're talking about the arch of uh, instability all, all the way from the Atlantic to the Red see and of course uh, the links in the Middle East and elsewhere. So I think we would have to uh, deal with that um, because for a long time we thought that the so-called Arab Spring or Arab Awakening is going to <coughs> uh, usher a new, I think, um, uh, era of uh, stability and peace and we just have to look at what's happening <coughs> in uh, Libya and elsewhere. But beyond that region, of course, we're very concerned about uh, what's, uh, what's happening in Eastern Europe and, and the Ukraine um, as we speak. Um, and we'll come back to it. And then, uh, obviously, we have to be concerned Central Asia and South Asia, as well as in the Pacific and the Far East. The bottom line is <coughs> the entire globe, obviously, if you will, is uh, deteriorating in terms of their security concerns. And the question is, can we talk about security through the law? And this is uh, a challenge that we would have to uh, deal with uh, today. Now, the other a point I would like to, to make very quickly uh, is to provide so-called an academic context to our 50 years, I stopped counting, of uh, academic uh, experience, specifically to focus on the role of law in conflict uh, resolution in general. In other words, the relevance of law in the struggle for power within and among and between uh, nations. So uh, one quick word about uh, the academic, intellectual, if you will, nourishment that I had uh, 
which for many years we struggled with the debates of politics and law, the different schools of thoughts about it, of, uh, if you will, realism, idealism, the rule of law, uh, all the way from uh, the education that I think we were privileged to have uh, at the University of uh, Chicago on the one end, people like Hans Morgenthau, the other end, like Quincy Wright of Columbia, Sam Huntington, the one end, and Philip Jessup on the other, and cooperating with uh, other institutions like uh, Yale with Earl Laswell <coughs> and uh, McDougall and so forth. So the key um, challenge that we had intellectually and practically for a long time is how can we strike a, a balance between security concerns uh, and, and the rule of, of law? Now, um, if I may, I would like to uh, just mention uh, two quick historical lessons that I think we have to keep in mind. Uh, one, one lesson that um, we had from the 16th century from Machiavelli, who said that the uh, principal foundation of a state are good laws and good arms. And you cannot have good laws where there are not good arms. So it's right to deal with both force and law. The second one uh, relates to Lord Palmerston of the UK statesman who said that there are no permanent friends nor enemies, but only permanent uh, interests. I think we have to keep this in mind. And finally, uh, we have a Arab um, proverb that I think relates to what we're going to discuss, that no right is lost as long as there is someone to claim it. And I think this is the bottom line about the situation. Now, of course, some of my colleagues, they ask me what kind of um, topics, which topics do I think that we should discuss? And of course, uh, it, it is a, a democracy, so each one can determine what is really relevant, but I said that the challenge to the panel, in my view, is that whether right versus might, in other words, whether might is right before the right is ready. That's number one. And whether the law is adequate to deal with the challenges of today and tomorrow. And I had a, a long list of topics I want to mention some, like those legal topics related to definitions, to fundraising, to this uh, suspect citizen, to the suspect <coughs> alien, to state-sponsored terrorism, conventional and unconventional weapons, criminal jurisdiction, sanctions, diplomatic aviation and maritime security, reward programs, the role of intelligence, detention, interrogation, civil trials, military tribunals, international courts, and uh, prison sentences, in other words, punishment, targeted killings, etc. The list goes on and on and on. So again, um, since it is a democracy, I certainly welcome our panel to speak on any of these or other uh, issues they wish. And as I indicated, our first speaker is Professor Kaplow. David, you want to come up there? I want to stand, yeah. You, your, your list is the semester's course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why you, you are going to deal with that. Um, thank you, Yona, and thank you, Don, and uh, and thank you to all the organizers who've assembled this 
quite diverse and, uh, and interesting uh, panel. And I look forward to the discussion that we'll have both with the panelists and with the audience. And with that in mind, I'll try to keep my own remarks relatively brief. What I'd like to do is to put before you four propositions about the fog of war, about the, uh, the nature of law, and in my case, it'll be especially about international law in our current environment, for contestable propositions, and indeed, I'm hoping that it's the contest that we'll spend most of our time talking about uh, and debating the validity of these, uh, of these arguments. But even before I launch into that, I'd like to uh, recite for you a brief passage that in some ways underpins or inspires uh, my views on these four propositions. It's a quotation from uh, Louis Brandeis, the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this passage. It comes from his dissenting opinion in the 1928 case of Olmstead versus the United States, which was the first time, really, that the US Supreme Court had to deal with uh, wiretapping as a, as a legal matter. And in his opinion, uh, Brandeis wanted to caution us that the, the time to be most apprehensive about the possibility of government overreach or government intrusions into uh, civil liberties, the time to be most concerned was when the government was acting with apparently benign motivations, when the government was doing the kinds of things that we want governments to try to do to promote the common defense, to protect public order. Those were the periods of greatest danger. And Brandeis wrote, experience should teach us to be most on our guard to protect liberty when the government's purposes are beneficent. Men born to freedom are naturally alert to repel the invasion of their liberty by evil-minded rulers. The greatest dangers to liberty lurk in insidious encroachments by men of zeal well-meaning, but without understanding. With that, I'd like to launch my four propositions. And the first of these is the uh, argument that law matters, international law matters in our fog of war world. This is, on those terms, a fairly modest claim that law matters, but it is a claim that is refuted, is disputed by many skeptics or realists who would claim that uh, law is merely epiphenomenal, that really what countries do is base their behaviors on a very hard-nosed calculation of self-interest. They do what is in their interest, regardless of what the law uh, might, uh, might seem to require. And I have to concede that there's a substantial bit of merit to that view, but I contend that law does matter, and it matters in a variety of ways. Let me sketch out three. First, international law matters in the foundational way of setting up the institutions, the organizations, the procedures through which states communicate and do business with each other. International law provides the rules of the road of the international community. And as with all other rules of the road, that facilitates a great deal of international traffic and communications. Uh, as with rules of the road, you know, it really doesn't matter fundamentally whether in a particular country people drive on the right side of the road or drive on the left side of the road, but it's really important that they all drive on the same side of the road, and international law provides that kind of support for the aspirations of the international community. The, in, this function of international law is called by some the wise restraints that make us free, the ability to give up a part of a state's sovereignty to accept a system of rules that provide even greater returns on that, uh, that investment. Second, international law matters in the sense that it creates legitimacy. It creates senses of expectations and reliance about how others will behave. And that factors into the reputation of states that factors into their calculation of self-interest. Um, even the most self-serving country has to be aware that if it behaves in a way that might seem to benefit itself, if that behavior conflicts with the expectations of the world community and generates an adverse reputation that makes other countries reluctant to do business with it in the future, that kind of cost factors into the, the, uh, the calculation of, 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 uh, of the, it factors into the utilitarian calculation, both in the long term and in the short term. And finally, perhaps most importantly, uh, international law matters because it creates rules about how states should behave. 
including on the most fundamental matters of use ad bellum and use in bello. It tells states what they can and can't do in a number of the most important circumstances. And in making this part of my claim, I have to be careful not to overstate. I don't want to assert that international law is always complied with any more than one could assert that domestic law is always complied with, even in a country like the United States, perhaps the most over-lawyerized society in the world. Uh, we all know that as a matter of domestic law, people and corporations and other players violate the law all the time. Why should we be so surprised if countries behave in a similar fashion in the international arena? In fact, uh, let me just note for you a little exercise that I often do with my international law classes when we're debating the important topic of is international law really law and try to make the comparison between compliance with international law and compliance with domestic law. I won't today ask for a show of hands, but think for yourself how many of you have violated a law today? Most people can't go 24 hours without breaking a law, whether it's speeding on the beltway or jaywalking across M Street or paying an illegal nanny or fudging on your income tax. Most people <laughs> violate laws all the time. Arrest him. <laughs> Uh, and why should we be surprised when countries behave with a similar sort of pattern of behavior? The best statement, I think, about compliance with international law is the famous one from Professor Lou Henkin, who said that almost all countries obey almost all laws almost all the time. That's far from 100% compliance, but I don't think you could say anything better than that about compliance with domestic law either. Um, states do care about their self-image, about their reputation, about the uh, patterns of communication that they're creating with each other, and that means that, uh, that international law does matter, not only in democracies, um, but all countries around the world. So that's my first point, that international law matters. My second argument is that law is typically a lagging indicator of social phenomena rather than a leading indicator. That is, by the time the world or a particular country gets around to enacting a statute or signing and ratifying a treaty, most of the time the new rule of law has already been well insinuated into the social fabric and the law therefore reflects the social change rather than prompting the social change. Uh, and that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, law, especially international law, is a crude tool. The mechanisms for generating international law are primitive and underdeveloped. In the international community, we do not have a functioning legislature that can churn out new laws the way a Congress, the way sometimes a Congress can. <laughs> we don't have an, an, uh, an international judicial system that plays a role in the international society the way that courts do in the United States. We don't have an international executive branch that plays the role in promulgating new rules uh, the way a well-functioning law, law system would have. And even when we do generate laws, too often, treaties are imprecise and unclear and lack the details that would be necessary, and that's not a surprise. It's very difficult for lawmakers, either in a legislature or in, uh, in treaty making, to contemplate the wealth of human experience that will have to be governed by these rules and, therefore, and the difficulty of amending and updating the, the rules uh, is, is often a, a frustrating experience. The, the passage that comes to mind here is from uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who observed that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. That more often, we cannot anticipate the demands that law will be expected to fulfill, either domestically or internationally. Rather, the law grows organically in response to the derived experience of human beings, and law is therefore um, more often a lagging indicator rather than a leading indicator of social experience. My third point is that the United States is at its strongest and at its most effective when it takes seriously the rhetoric of respect for the rule of law. Sometimes, it may be tempting when a country is a superpower, especially during a period when it is the only superpower, it may be tempting to disregard the trappings of law and pursue national self-interest or to do what seems to be the right thing even if it conflicts with uh, the, 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 the law of the day. Today, however, 
when we emerge changing circumstances, when we see the emergence of China as a near peer competitor and partner and potential adversary, we're reminded even more vividly about the value of having reliable systems of law that are adhered to even by the powerful players, even when their short run self interest might drive them in a different direction. And this means that we should be paying careful attention to precedent, to the models that we're creating, to the, to the, uh, to the lessons that we're teaching the world by our behavior. And as Jonah mentioned, there's lots of behavior around the world that needs to be attended to. When the United States supports uh, the use of military force and autonomy for Kosovo, we have to be aware not just what that means in the Kosovo situation, but also what are the implications for Russian action in Georgia. When the United States and its allies use military force in Libya or perhaps soon in, uh, in Syria, we have to ask what are the implications of that for Russian action in Ukraine? What's the neutral principle that the United States is modeling for other countries around the world and the principle cannot be we're the good guys? We have to be attentive to the perspectives that will be brought to bear on these kinds of issues uh, from a, a variety of different audiences. In the long run, hypocrisy is not, a, uh, hypocrisy or claims of exceptionalism cannot be a sound basis for international behavior. Finally, my fourth contention is that uh, despite all these challenges, traditional international law provides an adequate basis for responding to the challenges uh, and can, can adapt to the variety of changes that we confront. And we do, uh, we do live in an era of dramatic change. We live in an era of technological change where warfare today can include cyber activity, can include, ro uh, will include robotics of, uh, of an advanced design, where biomedical enhancements could change the nature of, intera of international dealings. We live in a world that is politically very, di very different from that uh, that our predecessors saw. In 1945, when drafting the UN Charter, no one would have foreseen the role that non-state actors, terrorist organizations, have come to play in the world today. Uh, we live in a period when states, the fundamental building block of the international system, are subject to extraordinary pressures of diverse sorts, both pressures to, uh, to split apart uh, a sort of efficient operation, as, as we may be seeing with Scotland today, um, at the same time, pressures toward fusion, toward amalgamation into ever greater entities in pursuit of, uh, of economic prosperity and security, as with the European Union and NATO and others. Uh, and finally, we see diverse kinds of national security threats that are non-traditional, that are uh, typical traditional tools uh, don't equip us well to deal with. And here I'm thinking about climate change and pandemic diseases such as Ebola. But the point for me is that international law, especially here, the law of armed conflict, has adapted successfully to revolutions in military affairs of that sort in the past, and it will, will be able to adapt to the similar revolutions that we're encountering today. The core principles, necessity, proportionality, discrimination, and avoidance of unnecessary suffering, are just as valid today as they were at the time of Grotius and Lieber and Martins, and they can be adapted, they will have to be adapted to the new circumstances, but, but that can be done. In conclusion, what I'd say about the uh, fog of war that our program directs us to is that law is not only relevant, it becomes most relevant in these trying circumstances, and that it is in times of transition and trauma that we most need to depend upon and adapt the tools of international law. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yona and Don and General Gray and all the other organizers and supporters of this uh, event. And thank you in the audience for coming. Uh, that's a very good uh, scene setter. And I'm now going to go into the weeds. Um, since uh, um, the question I thought to address had to do with the relevancy of the law of armed conflict, in particular in the fog of of war. Um, war is a political act. It is framed by law, however. But that doesn't in itself guarantee that the rule of law uh, 
will prevail. Uh, they're quite different issues, actually. Um, inter international law governing the use of force, the use ad bellum, uh, is rather simple. Under the law, a state is only permitted to use force uh, in individual or collective self-defense or pursuant to a UN Security Council resolution. That's it. No other uh, circumstances. So um, the question then becomes, what is individual or collective self-defense, and how far does it go, and does it include defense of citizens, does it include anticipation of an attack, do you have to wait for Pearl Harbor, if you see the, German, the Japanese fleet coming, can you uh, intercept it? Um, the second thing has to do with the laws of war, that is the law of armed conflict, or as is commonly said, international humanitarian law, they're interchangeable names for the same body of law, although um, I prefer laws of war because I think it's more precise. Um, they govern the conduct of military operations. And they, that body of law governs the conduct, whether it is an international armed conflict or whether it is a non-international armed conflict. And the lawfulness of the initiation of the conflict does not determine whether or not the operations are lawful. So uh, the fact that Nazi Germany engaged in a, law, a war of aggression does not mean that every military operation uh, its forces conducted was criminal. Most of them were, but not everyone, <laughs> per se. Um, um, now, the body of law that constitutes the law of armed conflict uh, has grown over the years and um, includes conventions like the four 1949 Geneva Conventions, which are the most uh, adhered to that of any body of law uh, in the international sphere to the point where they have become customary law and new states, Scotland, if it is a new state, God help us, um, uh, or God help the Scots, Anyway, um, if it becomes a new state, it will be bound by the Geneva Conventions without having to take a separate act because uh, every state in the world is so bound. And, um, um, but there are also much more controversial instruments of affecting the international law of armed conflict, notably uh, Protocol 1 of 1977 which the United States is not a party to, but which many of our allies are parties to, and which, uh, by its language, would make the use of nuclear weapons illegal. And uh, by its language would give combatant status to people who are farmers by day and fighters by night. And that's not something the United States uh, thinks it can live with. But we have to fight with allies who are parties to conventions like that, and so we have to find a practical solution to that problem. In short, um, it's, a, it's a body of complex law that we're talking about. Now, I thought I would uh, say a word about uh, necessity and proportionality, which, which are uh, common law terms, cust terms of customary international law, the practice of states that they engage in because they feel legally obliged to do it, and which are at the center of uh, the law governing the use of force. And, and they're not mechanical terms, and they're, in my view, best understood as tests of reasonableness. In other words, the use of force is necessary if there's no reasonable alternative, if you've tried everything you don't have to try it 10 times. You don't have to try to engage your enemy in a diplomatic conversation 10 times if, if you, you, any reasonable person would conclude it's pointless. Um, and proportionality, it's the amount of force reasonably calculated to bring to an end the condition that gave rise to the right to use force in the first place and to achieve lawful objectives. It's not tit for tat, 
somebody shoots you with a bow and arrow and you happen to have a gun, it doesn't mean you can't use your gun. Uh, now, use a nuclear weapon to respond to a bow and arrow, probably not a good idea. Um, but for lots of other reasons, simply because it'll ruin your day too. Um, um, and um, the principle of distinction that has arisen and is part of the law of military operations really has to do with the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. And I'd like to say a, a word or two about that and address the whole question of targeted killing, uh, which is a matter uh, that's uh, led to some confusion both in our own government and in commentaries. Um, first of all, um, combatant and non-combatant are defined in the 1949 Geneva Conventions. A combatant is allowed to kill. A non-combatant is not. Uh, so if you're in an armed force, if you wear a uniform, if you're subject to command, if you carry your arms openly, as specified in the Geneva Conventions, and you're captured, you're entitled to prisoner of war status. If you don't meet those standards, you're not a combatant. You may be a fighter, but you're a criminal. A battlefield is not a tourist destination, um, although it may be. I mean, I remember reading that people in Washington wandered outside, uh, got, went to Bull Run to see the, the Civil War fought. I don't think they liked quite what they saw, but anyway. Um, so uh, the, the Pentagon and American jurisprudence talks about unlawful combatants, but that's really not a useful term, and it's not, in my view, accurate. You're either a combatant or you're not. And if you're a combatant, you're entitled to prisoner of war status upon capture. And if you're not a combatant, you're not entitled to that status, which doesn't mean you're, you have no legal rights but it means that you can be prosecuted for murder or accessory to murder if it can be proved. Um, now, um, this leads to the problem of uh, who's a lawful target. If you're a combatant, you're a lawful target. If you are a military commander, you are a lawful target. If you are the President of the United States, you are a lawful target. You're commander in chief of the armed forces, even though it is a civilian position. Um, although the first occupant of the office, of course, was a general. Um, but he'd resigned his commission. So anyway, um, uh, if you're a lawful target, then you can be killed. And how you're killed doesn't really matter. You can be sniped at like. Uh, Admiral Nelson, or you could be, nowadays, you'd use a drone to get Admiral Nelson. You wouldn't bother with a, uh, uh, a sniper in the rigging of some French ship at the Battle of Trafalgar. You'd send an unmanned drone. Um, so, uh, but the question is, is therefore, is the person a lawful military target as a matter of international law and that is not a due process question. You're not taking away someone's rights. You're engaged in armed conflict with a legitimate enemy. And um, that's, the, that's the issue. And uh, it's a bit circular. If you're a target, you're a target, you're a target. But uh, nonetheless, um, that's the law as I see it. Um, now, um, as I said, at the beginning, and I'll conclude because I know time is short. Um, the rule of law is not assured simply by having uh, rules. And um, uh, the United States, uh, I believe, has a particular obligation, both constitutional and moral, to advance the rule of law. It's in our interests, and it's required uh, by our constitutional government. And when we run away from it, uh, we get into endless trouble. And a good example, I believe, is the um, detention of people in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, uh, that decision reflects a fear of constitutional process and um, a big mistake. And we've got ourselves in a position where we don't know how to get out of it, actually. Now, um, 
and whether um, uh, law can be uh, a language of the resolution of problems and the enhancement of security uh, depends on as much on whether people agree on what the law is as anything else. But legal reasoning is a discipline unto itself, and that is, uh, in my view, what we should use in our diplomacy and in our uh, public statements, and it can, if properly uh, advanced, I think, bring uh, a more common understanding about what the law is uh, than might at first appear. And that is how it could be a solution rather than a problem. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Wallace, Professor Alexander, and General Gray. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure to be here with you today. My participation in this program is personal and not as a representative of the Library of Congress or any U.S. government yes, institution. Yes, I have said that, too. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> I, am, I am saying for both of us. The subject, matter of <laughs> the subject matter of this discussion is the relevancy of the laws of war in light of the hostilities taking place in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. During a speech at the Hawaii University School of Law early this year, I think it was in February, Justice Scalia made a statement and a prediction. In the statement, he said, the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Korematsu versus United States is wrong. In the prediction, he said, you are kidding yourself if you think the same thing will not happen again. The same thing he was referring to was the internment during World War II of tens of thousands of Japanese Americans, which the Supreme Court upheld as legal. <coughs> to buttress his prediction, Justice Scalia invoked the Latin adage attributed to Cicero, and I should have Professor Wallace help me pronounce it because he pronounced it very well, inter arma enem silent legis, which means in times of war, the laws fall silent. The armed conflicts in Syria, Iraq, and many other countries prove Cicero to be right. The laws of war or of armed conflict, also called international humanitarian law, in contradistinction to international human rights laws, developed over time and most comprehensively after World War II. These laws are divided into three categories known in their fancy Latin names as use ad bellum, use in bello, and use post bellum. The first category regulates the framework and circumstances under which the initiation of war or the use of force is justified. The second category deals with the limitations imposed on the methods and means used in the prosecution of war or of the use of, war, uh, of, of force. And the third category focuses on issues that postdate the ending of hostilities. Most of the rules and the principles of the laws of armed conflict have been codified in international treaties and conventions or recognized by courts as a part of the international customary law. Normally, these rules apply to international armed conflicts, but some of them apply to internal armed conflicts as well. Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions specifically provides 
in the case of internal armed conflict for the application at a minimum of certain protections to non-combatants, including prohibition of violence to life and the person, prohibition of taking hostages, and the prohibition of humiliating and degrading treatment. Any party to an armed conflict must comply with these provisions irrespective of who initiated the hostilities and how the other parties behave. Based on what we know from the media and from other sources, all the parties to the armed conflict in Syria have repeatedly violated these provisions. The death toll in Syria as of 2013, when the United Nations stopped counting, is estimated to have exceeded the 100,000 mark, most of which is blamed on the Syrian government. On the other side, notorious cases of killings and kidnappings by the opposition abound. Among them are the killing of American and the British journalists, the kidnapping of Christian nuns who were later released after a long time in captivity, and the kidnapping of two Christian bishops whose fate is still uncertain. My focus is on Syria because this is where the group, calling itself the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, known as ISIS or ISIL, control a big swath of land, and where the United States have apparently decided to engage in war activities under the semantic name of counterterrorism. Last week, the US president, probably he wants to prove Professor Kaplu right. The president addressed the nation and the world to outline a four-pronged plan to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy, as he said. He, correct, he correctly described ISIL as a cancer to be eradicated and its actions in, in taking the lives of two Americans as acts of barbarism. In the second prong of, his, prong of his strategy, the president said, we have ramped up our military assistance to the Syrian opposition and called on Congress to give his administration additional authority and resources to train and equip these fighters. Standing up, for and destroying ISIL is certainly a noble cause, morally admirable, and is a legitimate act of protecting the security of our homeland. Equally admirable is the standing up to dictators and tyrannical governments. But accomplishing that through training and arming of rebel fighters is a violation of international humanitarian law. The Kellogg Bryant Pact of 1928 explicitly <coughs> condemns and renounces recourse to war as an instrument of national policy. The Charter of the United Nations further requires in Article 2.4 all member countries to refrain from the threat or use of force against other states training and arming rebel fighters to undermine the government of a member state involve the threat and use of force as confirmed by the International Court of Justice in the ruling Nicaragua versus United States of America and is therefore against the international law. The armed conflict we are witnessing in Syria started as a legitimate uprising against tyranny, against oppression, and against, and against abuse of human rights. But it was taken over by groups who believe they are the enforcers of the divine word of God. These groups 
and other similar groups in Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Nigeria, Mali, and many others, many other places, are the product of a distorted teaching of the noble religion of Islam, a teaching that rejects the other, espouses violence, and treats terrorism as a sure ticket to paradise. Defeating these terrorists by military force alone is impossible. In 2001, we had Al-Qaeda plotting against us from the dark caves of Tora Bora. 13 years later, with trillions of dollars spent and thousands of our brave soldiers <coughs> dead or injured, we ended, up, we ended up with a worse version of Al-Qaeda operating in the bright light of day from the, from the birthplace of civilization. Our failure to effectively face terrorism is not caused by deficiencies or insufficiencies in existing laws and regulations. In fact, I believe we have too much of both. Defeating ISIL and its likes is a complex endeavor that requires our intellectual resolve to confront the religious component of their ideology and the might of our military to face down their fighters on the ground. Our military leaders and personnel have done their part brilliantly, but we, as a nation, are still lagging far behind. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to thank uh, all my colleagues, and certainly uh, Don and Yona and General Gray for giving us all the opportunity to speak here this afternoon. Uh, I think by now everyone has a good sense that there are two strands of the law relating to the use of force, the use ad bellum and the use in bello. I think Nick very well set out a lot of the details of the use in bello, the laws of armed conflict, international humanitarian law. I just want to say one thing about them and then focus on the use ad bellum. Now, the, the one thing is, as we look at non-state actors, and as Nick and others have observed, the Geneva Conventions were really not intended to deal with non-state actors, and so what we've had to do is make some adaptations. Some of those adaptations have been good, some of those adaptations have been very, very poor. As a consequence, what I actually think we need is something we're probably not going to get anytime soon, but I think we need it, and that is a new Geneva Convention which would effectively address the status of these non-state actors. I think there are too many lacunae in the existing Geneva Conventions. We can adapt with them, we can work with them, but it'd be much better if we could get that. Now, will we be able to get the political will? Will we be able to get the kind of leadership necessary to do that? That's another question. Right now, I, I, I don't see it happening, but I think ideally that would be what we would want to see. Now, here's a, a shameless self-promotion. My uh, colleague, Mark Lagon, and I just finished a book entitled Human Dignity and the Future of Global Institutions, and I wrote uh, one of the chapters in that dealing with the problem of terrorism and international humanitarian law. So I have a bunch of copies up there if anybody wants to, to, to pick that up. But, 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 but that's not what I want to focus on. What I want to problematize, if I might, is the United Nations Charter Framework for the Recourse to Force. Nick laid it out very, very clearly. And of course, everybody has their, their handy dandy uh, pocket copy of the UN Charter, as I see Nick does. The Charter framework is very straightforward. Article 2, paragraph 4 prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. As Nick said, there are only two exceptions in the Charter, only two force an individual and collective self-defense if an armed attack has occurred, and force authorized by 
the Security Council. That's what was designed in 1945. It seemed to make a lot of sense in 1945. Here's the problem, in my view, and here's the fog. International law is created through treaty and through custom, which reflects state practice. This was a treaty that was promulgated in 1945. What has the custom been since 1945? Have states, in fact, refrained from using force against the territorial integrity or political independence of states? The answer to that is, in my view, is clearly no. Is it enough no that we would conclude that the charter framework, this treaty framework, is no longer good law? Is the answer enough no? Is state practice so at variance with the charter provisions that we have to say the charter has effectively fallen, fallen into disuetude, that the charter framework does not reflect contemporary customary international law. In 1970, our friend, the late Thomas Frank, wrote an article in the American Journal of International Law where he asked the question, who killed Article 2.4? And that was in 1970. More recently, Michael Glennon of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy has raised similar questions about the status of the charter framework. As we look at recent events, and in particular, I think, of Russian actions in Eastern and Ukraine, and in the annexation of the Crimea, these actions really raise the question of whether states are, in fact, abiding by something resembling Article 2.4, or whether state practice is so at variance that we do have to conclude that the charter framework for the use ad bellum no longer reflects contemporary international law. Now, my conclusion, sadly, is that since 1945, while states still affirm the charter framework, they, no, nobody comes out at the UN Security Council and says the charter framework is not good law. While states still affirm the charter framework in various ways over the years, using different justifications, states have claimed that they could do something at variance with the charter, and in fact, have used force at variance with the charter. The reaction of the international community, or largely the non-reaction of the international community to Russia's recent actions, seems to confirm this. This is horrible, if this is the case. But my real fear is that there's a huge fog surrounding the use ad bellum. While the charter framework is what is affirmed in informal settings, in, in various operations of international organizations, state practice, and what states actually do, states, as the creators of international law, have effectively rejected the charter framework and have created a more permissive, nearly self-help environment for the recourse to force. I don't believe that's a good development. But in my view, it is the development that we have in contemporary international law. And international legal scholars, policymakers, those in international organizations have to think <coughs> about how we combat that. My sense is that's a much more challenging task than even trying to make some revisions to the Geneva Convention and deal with international humanitarian law. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here, and um, I guess I would like to follow up on what uh, Tony has raised on the use ad bellum side, the questions of the lawful resort to force. Um, and I think that I very much agree, in fact, with Tony that uh, this is uh, really the state practice is not what it is that the formal words on paper reflect. And I would like to pick up that same point and now shift us back to the other side of the law of war, namely the conduct rules, the in bello rules, the rules for the conduct of hostilities. And I guess I would express it by saying that I am actually just enormously struck, puzzled, and dismayed by, on the one hand, exactly the situation that you describe in Syria, the slaughter of the civilians, the emergence of forms of barbarism in war that have uh, 
always been there, but accepted even generally by the parties involved as being um, deviant behavior, as being in some sense criminal, as being in some sense reprehensible, as being illegitimate. And that's not what we're seeing in the barbaric acts that are being performed um, today. These are being asserted as it is actually a very good thing to wind up slaughtering captured fighters from the other side, to line them up and just shoot them. Uh, it's a good thing to behead uh, hostages that you've taken and put it up on YouTube. And so we are in a moment in which there is an aggressive pressing of an alternative legitimacy and an alternative narrative about how one should see what is actually acceptable behavior um, in the conduct of these affairs. And so I'm, I'm struck by that even beyond, so to speak, the sheer level of the slaughter itself. And then I turn and ask myself, as somebody who is a law of wars lawyer, somebody who spent much of my career pursuing these kinds of issues, and think, what's the response of my community? I mean, of course, we're shocked and outraged and all of that sort of stuff. And we, I include myself, believe that if in some fashion the rules as we've regarded them, the universal rules of the law of armed conflict, the uh, rules of... Uh, military necessity, uh, distinction, proportionality, humanity uh, were applied. They are, in fact, perfectly capable of regulating this behavior, but somehow they are not. And it isn't just that they are not regulating the behavior, it is that they are somehow engaged in an act of sort of pure narcissism. That the body of law and my community as the interpreters of that, the sort of loose community of academics and NGO workers and international officials and all that sort of stuff, um, is on the one hand completely horrified by what's going on, but when it comes to the body of the rules themselves, are sort of gazing into the basin and seeing ourselves, and we're really you know, um, pretty in love with what we see. Um, we are constructing an ever more complicated, nuanced, subtle, frankly beautiful, right, formal body of law. It isn't doing what we thought it was going to be doing, and the reasons that it's not are not things that we are confronting as far as I'm concerned in the international uh, community. And it essentially, I think, comes down to the fact that underlying the beauty uh, and the beautiful structure of the rules, the thing that we see in the mirror and think we're so well of ourselves, um, underlying that is an uneasy balance that has been there from the beginning, from clear back in the sort of um, creation of this body of law in the 19th century. Um, and there are three sort of delicately balanced principles that have been um, procedurally involved here. One is that the rules are the same for all parties. Right? The conduct rules are the same. They don't vary depending on who you happen to be. There isn't an alternative legitimacy, and because you are the weaker side, you're not held to a lesser standard of the rules. The second thing is that the rules are reciprocal. Right? And traditionally, that was taken to mean that if the other side didn't follow the rules, you were entitled to engage in reprisals, and you were entitled to engage in reprisals that were in the first place intended to force them to come back to the rules by doing the same thing to them that they were violating. But at some point, the rule itself is lost and neither side is obliged to adhere to it. Now, we don't believe, and I don't believe for a moment, that we ought to return to a reprisal situation because in the rules that most matter in terms of their violation today, these are abuses against civilians and abuses against captured um, fighters. And, you know, nobody that I know is going to stand up and suggest that we ought to start taking hostages from among the other side and shooting them. Um, we're, we're not going back to that, and we shouldn't, and obviously we shouldn't. But that's not going to work out so well insofar as the third principle that we assert is that the obligations to adhere to the rules of war are independent on a side and irrespective of what the other side does. These three are sort of in a position of pick any two, right? 
it's it's like the um, you know proposition about you know God is good and then how's there evil. It's kind of how do you square all those things? I would suggest that the reason we have such a beautiful structure of the rules that has so little purchase on what's going on today and less and less as time goes on um, is because we have decided that we are going to relax the requirement of the same body of rules um, for one side rather than the other. The guerrilla side going back to the 1970s negotiations, the non-state actor side today. We do not hold them to the same set of rules when it comes to fighting. We state the formal rules. We never quite come out and say, oh, they're held to something different. But the reality is we do. We sort of, ex we don't really expect them, you know, they're barbarians. What do you expect, right? I mean, um, that's going to be a problem for something that is supposed to be a reciprocal system. And, of course, what falls along the wayside then second is any form of reciprocity. We don't have an enforcement mechanism to enforce that the sides adhere to the same set of rules because we've dropped the most um, historically traditional ones, which was you grab the civilians or you grab the captured uh, prisoners, you selected a random group of the officers, and you shot them. Right? We're not going back there, and we have this big problem about what we're going to do instead. Now, there are two answers to that. The international community generally has said independence then is what survives out of those three. Each side has an independent obligation to act in a certain way. But in doing that, we say, we promise that eventually we will even this all out again and address the problem of sameness and the loss of reciprocity. And our way of doing that is, we're going to put the bad guys on trial. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think the ICC is an excellent, excellent idea as a sort of bit player for mechanisms of compliance that actually apply to sides and do not pretend that war is reducible to individuals, because that's what we've done. We've made essentially the enforcement of the laws of war is something that is about individual liability and individual criminal law. War is not an individual activity. It is a political activity, and it is a social activity, and it only makes sense if one conceives of it as sides, as corporate sides, in which the sides have strategic goals, they have military necessity, and they also have normative obligations. We've essentially dropped that in favor of a mechanism that essentially individualizes it and personalizes it, and then we seem quite surprised when it doesn't seem to actually have an effect on the corporate sides um, to any great degree. All right, then the sides are held in an asymmetrical fashion to these rules. So the United States winds up essentially being told, you have to internalize the cost of violation by all the other guys out there. The human the Civilians are on, within the law itself, an ever upward scale of sort of a perfect utopian vision about they can't be inconvenienced to the point of being told they must leave their homes, right, in the middle of battle. And the question is, how do you wind up resolving that um, if you don't think that you're going to just arrest all the bad guys at some point down the road and put them on trial? The U.S. has had one answer to that, the same answer that it has always had to any of these kind of problems, which is, let's go find the engineers and invent a new technological fix. That fix in the course of the last 12 years has mostly been called drone warfare. We forget the reasons that drove drone warfare to go zooming up as much as it did, but it was essentially the question of how do you use precision technologies in order to go after the people that you're trying to go after and that you're lawfully entitled to go after when they're hiding themselves among the civilians and you can't send in people to be able to sort of directly confront people that are sort of putting civilians in front of them. And it's not a perfect solution by any means, but that's our answer. Our answer is to try and find a technological fix. It's not going to work in the long run because I'm pretty sure that the people who are violating the rules of war in a behavioral sense are going to figure out ways to do it faster than we can come up with new technologies to be able to sort of address their behavioral violations. The same is going to wind, and then the international community comes back and is, to my sort of amazement, incredibly annoyed at the idea that precision warfare should be a good thing. 
I mean, I've spent my early career running the landmines campaign for Human Rights Watch and spent my time talking to U.S. military designers saying, you've got to get more precise weapons. 25 years they've done that, and we're headed even further in that direction in the form of autonomous weapon systems. And the international community is saying, no, you shouldn't be going that direction, I mean, a fair number of them. Um, this is a disaster. You essentially leave a side without mechanisms by which it's going to be able to win. Now, let me just close this because I know I'm out of time by saying I think the problem in many respects comes down to we have essentially altered the sort of delicate balance of those three principles in some ways I think that were morally required such as we're not going to shoot civilian hostages. But we have not left ourselves with any effective mechanism by which we are going to make up the gap. My community seems to be, you know, Jackson Lears defined narcissism once as being, um, it's not self-love, it's actually the inability to distinguish between the world and oneself. Right? And that, I think, is kind of where my normative community is. We are coming up with an ever more pure vision of this thing that is ever less enforceable. It's more complicated than lawyers even can understand. And by the time we get to the end of this, I would say that, to uh, borrow from Mary Douglas, that we are caught in a paradigm that's somewhere between purity and danger. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, very rich and profound, I think, presentations. Uh, you raised uh, many important uh, questions. Uh, what I um, suggest as a uh, moderator, if uh, the um, members of the panel would like to respond to some of these views, I have my own, but I'm going to wait. Um, would you like to? I'd, I'd like to hear what they have to say. Yeah. You, you want to hear first, but OK. <coughs> um, <coughs> all right, I, uh, let me ask you a question first. You know, it seems to me, of course, um, talking about the. Uh, to I'm sorry? To whom your question is going to be different? To, to, to anyone, I mean, um, basically, um, when we talk about uh, war and, and technology and the drone, the targeted uh, killing, but uh, since uh, the nature of war changes in terms of human shields, for example, when, when you target, for example, a known terrorist or your adversary, obviously you can affect the lives um, of innocent people, and this is the problem which would bring us to the uh, war crimes and the ICC and all that. So my question is, are we talking about a standard of behavior or we're talking about double standard in terms of the relations between and among states? In other words, the law, whenever it's convenient to those who believe in that particular cause and those who violate the law. For example, you find that the Iraqis would like to bring the British leadership to the ICC for violations of uh, war crimes, or the Gaza situation is another uh, example. So my question is, are we dealing with standards that were accepted um, by the international community for many years? Or are we talking about now the double standards that we witness every single day? Yes. Uh, I guess from what I said a few minutes ago, if you can guess where I was going with um, I think we have turned it into an important area. It's not every area, of course, but an important area, so as you described. Um, we have turned it into a double standard, um, but it's a double standard in which we continue to recite the formal law, but our behavior turns it into a, a double standard. And I think that one of the big risks of where we're headed with this is to wind up 
moving the uh, difference between the standards to which we hold sides and to wind up essentially deciding to make that the new law. So that if you are um, the weaker side, well, gosh, I guess you really don't have any choice but to hide among the civilians and to use them as you know, your sort of, I mean, what else are you going to do? Um, and to accept that as a virtual form of military necessity and cease trying to you know, make any effort to um, prevent sides from doing that. So I, I think that we're evolving um, that direction and that in important areas we probably are already to the point of a double standard already. Okay, anyone else? If not, let me move on. We <coughs> have a um, great deal of experience uh, in the room. Stanley, about you identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, Stanley Cover. Uh, I have a question about something that hasn't been addressed so far. On the targeted killings, especially of American citizens, in justifying it, um, the Attorney General Eric Holder said, due process is not necessarily judicial process. If that is the case, do we have the rule of law? If the president on his own can make this decision without any review by anybody else, if the American people are not even entitled to see the legal memorandum, a court ordered him to provide a copy that was heavily redacted, do we have the rule of law at all, or are we gravitating toward a system of enlightened despotism? which our founders called elective monarchy. They warned against us. If there is no check and balance. Please. Uh, first of all, I, I, I have to make the disclaimer that I forgot to make. Um, <laughs> since I'm paid by the Department of Defense, they will really take offense if I don't say that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on theirs, which I would have thought perfectly obvious. Um, I, I obviously don't agree with the Attorney General. I thought his uh, legal memorandum was absurd and um, the position of the administration is wrong. It is perfectly lawful to kill an American soldier serving in the Wehrmacht during World War II. And if an American citizen is serving with Al Qaeda and engaged in combat against the United States, engaged in organizing terrorist attacks, and is not amenable to uh, arrest, that person, in my view, is a lawful target under the law of armed conflict. End of story. It is not a question of judicial process. And I think there's a great confusion uh, about that. Um, if the person is arrested, of course that person is entitled to uh, due process rights. If the person's arrested and prosecuted, it's one of the problems I have with the situation in Guantanamo. It seems to me as a matter of policy, and I've written this, that the United States should treat all those detainees as if they were combatants. Because then if they're, they're prisoners of war until the end of the conflict, if you prosecute them and you get a conviction, they serve their sentence, and then they go back to being prisoners of war. If they're acquitted, they go back to being prisoners of war. But to say, these are dangerous people, we're not going to prosecute them, and we're not going to treat them as prisoners of war, means they're in a kind of legal no man's land, and we don't know what basis we're keeping them. So uh, while I don't think we're headed toward um, a uh, dictatorship or um, the rule of law is in jeopardy in the United States, I do think the administration's position is, is, uh, is rebuttable. I think it's weak, and, um, and I think we ought to do something about it. We, citizenry, ought to do something about it, and, and Congress pays attention to constituent mail, so I encourage everybody to write the congressman. Uh, can I, can I ask what you said? Um, um, well, I'm a professor. That's supposed to be part of a, a fog machine. Well, well you know, they're, they're professors and professors, Nick. Uh, you know, um, Issam said there's too much law. I wonder what he meant by that. I think, though, you have conflated two things. 
Uh, I agree with you completely, by the way, about Alok and all the others. But of course, Holder wasn't probably thinking of international law so much. He's thinking of constitutional law. And that's where the expression comes of due process. And he was saying, in effect, under our, and, uh, and, uh, as you say, it was very redacted, uh, he was saying that uh, as a matter of the U.S. domestic constitutional law, the commander in chief can deal with uh, these characters as he wishes, and they're not subject to court review. Due process really means the courts. But I suppose he was saying we have an internal procedure where four aides of the White House, you get me, look at the dossier, because presumably there's internal paperwork. And um, I think so, I think in a way they're two different issues. Well, I mean, part of the problem, I think, uh, arises from the language of the authorization to use military force in 2001, which says the president is authorized to use all necessary means against persons who were involved in 9-11, um, which makes the pre I mean, normally the Congress resolves to authorize the use of force against aggression committed by North Vietnam against South Vietnam or uh, something like that. It doesn't say persons. Yeah, but and there's a suggestion that the president can say, well, Wallace, you know, I don't like the cut of your jib anymore. You're well, finished. It's even, it's even worse, of course, because you have Castillo. You could, the guy picked Padilla, was he? You could pick some guy up, anybody, at the airport in Chicago. But I think that's, uh, the point is they were non-state actors, and I think that's what Tony was getting at. In other words, Al-Qaeda was not seen as a state, and they didn't know what to say, and, and the legislative draftsmen are good, but they're not, you know, prophets. Right, but, you know, um, this is the 100th anniversary of World War I, and um, the Germans used human shields in Belgium. Um, uh, Non-state actors were used by the Germans in Poland and Czechoslovakia in, in the 1930s uh, by the Japanese in China. This is not new. Uh, people act as if it were a new phenomenon and had never been confronted before. Yeah, but you know, again, Nick, just to be, just to chat, you know, Voltaire made this witty remark, you know, history does not repeat itself, but men always do. Yeah. We know human behavior is for the birds, but we're talking about law, and there are two bodies of law has been suggested, sort of the UN system uh, that Sir Sunshine David and others address, and then there's the sort of the Geneva system, and I have the impression from the discussion today that they're both inadequate in very different ways. So you have two bodies of different <coughs> law, both are inadequate, and of course, if there's, hole, if there's holes in the Swiss cheese, you know, things are going to go through. Anyone else on the panel on that? Okay, let's move on to, yes, uh, David. <coughs> Can you get the mic? Hi, uh, my name is David Daoud. I'm a graduate of Suffolk University Law School in International Law, concentrated on laws on conflict. Uh, one thing I'd like to address, you mentioned we need a new body of law, Professor uh, Aaron. Um, a new Geneva Convention. Well, is it practical? I mean, has have has there ever not been a double standard? Actually, has has international law always been an outgrowth of Western states' worldview for Western states, which we try to apply to uh, the rest of the international community? Doesn't uh, that never saw things that way? And now, you know, we see ISIS. It's not a breakdown of international law. It's, uh, we see groups, you know, we see states that don't act in accordance of, with international law. It's not a breakdown of international law so much as um, they just never held that world, world view that international law was valid ab initio. So going forward, how would you deal with that? You're not dealing with the inadequacy of the law itself. You're dealing with a whole set of the world that no matter what law you legislate, no matter what law you put on the books, will never adhere to it. Well, there are a couple different issues there. On the one hand, it is clear that the edifice of international law that was handed down to the world uh, circa 1945 was based on the interaction of Western states operating in a Westphalian system. The rest of the world was either not in a position to participate or was under colonial rule. And so as states gained their independence, what we did start to see were challenges to this edifice. But what I would ultimately say is, in the main, we saw the newly independent states challenging some specific rules, but ultimately buying into most of the edifice of international law, both customary law and treaty law, because it was in their interest. And so, you know, by the end of the Cold War, there really was widespread state support 
throughout the world for international law, even though it may have had its origins in this sort of imperialistic uh, approach. But there's another problem, and the problem is really this. In 1977, Hedley Bull wrote a book called The Anarchical Society, and he was looking at the possible futures of the international system. And one thing he opined is that maybe the international system is going to become what he called a neo-medieval system, meaning we'll see states, but we'll see super states, we'll see sub-state actors, we'll see trans-state political actors unlike the pure Westphalian model. Now, something like ISIS is one of those actors. If we looked at the, uh, the graphic that uh, Yona put up earlier when he was looking at Al-Shabaab and uh, Boko Haram and all these groups, don't respect state boundaries the same way the Westphalian system says you should. And then you have these sort of trans-state groups that, that interact in several states. Well, Bull was writing in 77, if this is the case, if the world is going to continue to be messy and is not simply going to settle back into a state system with everybody operating within a defined border, then you have to ask yourself, this is an existential question for the nature of international law, not are we not going to have international law, but are we going to have a different system of international legal rules that is somehow going to be created by the messy interaction of these disparate non-state actors with states and with one another. And so some would opine that that may be what we will see 20 or 30 years down the road. There'll be international legal rules because going back to Professor Coppola's point, law is really in the interest of every actor in, in different sorts of ways. Even the non-state actors, they have an interest in predictability, regularity of behavior, being able to realize their interest through some kind of rule of law system. So that may be what we're going to see two possible futures. One, we just settle back into the old state system, more or less like it is, or we move to something else where there's a very complex, <laughs> very, very messy circumstance where law arises to the interaction of these different actors. Maybe that's what's, I don't know the answer, but maybe that's what's going to happen, and that may be addressing your point. Yes, you may. Yes, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, one question I have was, I can remember, uh, okay. you want a mic? <laughs> Yeah, ISIS is sort of a state. It apparently collects taxes. It pays civil service bureaucrats like they were paid by, before by the, Syri the government of Syria or whatever. So it seems to me you could view ISIS at least as a de facto state, even if not perhaps not as a de jure. The same thing might apply to a lesser degree to Al-Qaeda, at least in terms of the, the rules of war. I look at these guys in, in Guantanamo as being prisoners of war. Apparently other people don't look at them that way, but that's the way I've looked at them ever since they were there. The only thing is the war is not going to end any time soon, unlike the German or Japanese war did in '45. And so these guys might be sitting down on, on the beach in Guantanamo a long time. But I see nothing wrong with them treating them as prisoners of war. Somebody pointed out that war is a kind of corporate thing. You can't really look at these guys as in, to me, as individual criminals, uh, you know, they, they weren't wearing uniforms. That's maybe criminal behavior. But they had guns. They were on their side of the hill. You know, everybody knew they were there. And so I just look at them as, as, as more or less uh, POWs. And, uh, you know, by analogy to ordinary warfare where the other guy is wearing a regular uniform. into groups that are uh, terrorists in the first place. And terrorism is not actually or as a sort of general international crime. There's a number of specific treaties that criminalize particular things in it. Um, but generally speaking, using force as a non-state actor, um, you're subject to the domestic laws of the state that you're in. And that's you know, the burden you face. They can hang you if they get a hold of you. Um, and so these guys are terrorists, and we have extensive long-arm jurisdictional laws, and so do lots of other places that reach this. Um, but it would be a mistake to wind up thinking of them as being, these are just kind of like any other 
and they are fused into an internal insurgency within a given state and the enormous danger that the U.S. faces. Um, and it's precisely you know, your arc of instability across this um, region. Um, what the real phenomenon that we're describing is not one that is special to the Islamic State, and it's not one that's special to um, just this border territory between uh, Iraq and Syria. It's the same pattern marching across this entire sort of uh, North African arc. It is one in which you have a transnational terrorist group. It needs a territorial base. As with any guerrilla organization, it has to have some form of cross-border haven, some place that it can retreat to. If you're just a little terrorist group, you may just need a safe house. You may just need a little place to have a training camp. Um, but those are easily attacked, frankly, especially in the period of drones. And so I think that the response to that has been to develop a two-tier territorial strategy where the, the externally <coughs> oriented terrorist actor is conjoined to an internal insurgent actor which is mounting regular insurgency warfare and its purpose is to gain entire swaths of territory to gain their political governance. And within those places, then, they wind up hosting the terrorist group. I think the U.S. military has known for a very long time, the intelligence community has clearly been framing its strategy since at least 2008 or 2009 on the anticipation that across North Africa, we are going to be in the position of essentially proxy wars. Proxy counterinsurgency wars on the inside of those states, and then at the same time using our counterterrorism tools against um, the terrorist actors within those things. And it's not really a different strategy between what we are talking about in relation to ISIS and what it is that we are now going to have to confront with Boko Haram and Nigeria, Somalia, and a whole bunch of Yemen and a bunch of other places. That's the position, I think, strategically we find ourselves in. Yeah, please. Um, thank you for this uh, My name is Jonathan Strom. I'm a former adjunct of international law and Israeli law at Georgetown. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is for Dr. Koplow. I would posit there's a small change in one of your, your postulations that nations act not in disregard to war, but that they act as whatever they see fit, and then they'll find the law upon which to justify their actions. Um, and Professor Rosso, I'd love to hear a little bit more of a discussion about the targeted, your opinion on targeted killings and the collateral damage um, after. I mean, I can get a sense of where you, where you stand based on your answer to the previous question, but uh, one of the big issues is what happens when you target somebody and then there are 20 other people in the room. Um, how do you justify that action? And then Professor Suliba, I would, <coughs> my question is really, Judging from what you said, you can never support a um, a group that is a, a opposed to the current government. Um, I mean, that's kind of what that was my takeaway from what you said, and I'm not sure that that's um, that's right. So that would, those are my questions. Well, uh, that's very generous of you. You've given each of us an opportunity to give another yeah. speech, <laughs> uh, and so I'll, uh, so mine will be short. Um, I think you're right. There's a, an awful lot of practice where the government, the, the, the policy uh, policymakers decide on a course of action and then ask the lawyers to cover it, to find some justification for it. Um, it's not just governments that behave that way. Corporations behave that way. Families behave that way. Individuals behave that way. Um, but I think that's not the only way in which they behave, that sometimes the policymakers also go to the lawyers and say, we're thinking about doing X or Y, would it be lawful to do so? And if the lawyers say, no, you can't do X, you can do Y, you gotta change to Z, sometimes that changes state's behavior. Uh, and, uh, and that, to me, is what it means to be governed by the rule of law, is where you do have to be constrained to some extent by what the, uh, the <coughs> legal rules are. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, when he was a Russian ambassador to the UN, always said the same thing. He'd heard international law used uh, in every conceivable situation to defend every conceivable action. Um, the, the issue of, of collateral damage, 
of, of non-combatant uh, casualties as a result of military operations of any kind, whether it's a targeted killing, so-called, or a sniping, um, or anything else, is is part and parcel of war, and a judgment is always having to be made as to whether the military objective is worth whatever other damage might be um, caused. Uh, the good thing about precision weapons is that they, if, if they operate properly and are targeted properly, the amount of collateral damage can be uh, limited. My uncle was a uh, targeteer during World War II, and he said that if um, there had been a communication center on the fourth floor of a skyscraper in Berlin in the 1940s, and they wanted to take it out uh, using the weapons available at the time, uh, they probably would have leveled the city and missed the target. Uh, he was contrasting that with the single bomb that went down four floors and took out the command and control system in Baghdad in 1991. Yes, um, yeah. uh, I was describing the situation under present uh, existing law, international law. Uh, yes, any arming and the training of fighters against a government is against the law. Now, there are ways to do it. If you go to the uh, internet, to the uh, Security Council, get a resolution, then it becomes legal. Or if it was in self-defense, it's legal. Now, do we want to change that or not? But the existing law, I'm describing what the existing law is. Can, can I just add one, one more thing? Um, th there's another perspective on the role of lawyers in national security decision making. Uh, and that's the perspective from inside the government. Many people who uh, I think have, have worked for the government, and there, the criticism of lawyers is not that they too easily come along and justify everything. Yeah, that's <laughs> the right. criticism of lawyers is they too often say no, and that's why people often don't want to go to their lawyers in government because the lawyer will stop them from doing something that might be otherwise politically appealing. So there's a different way of looking at it from the inside as well. Okay. Um, uh, Milton Honig, I, I think I'm uh, going over something which was uh, just spoken about, but it's, I'm very specific. First of all, I'm only learning about um, distinction, proportionality, and all that stuff. But um, specifically, uh, am I wrong in feeling that there's much more attention being given to collateral damage for drone strikes, a higher technology, than for m more conventional strikes like in Gaza? where the collateral damage is uh, substantially larger. But I get a feeling that uh, drone strikes uh, get all the attention and uh, much more than other kinds of conventional collateral damage. Why is that? We do the drones, of course, in the United States. Yes, please. I think that's actually an important point because um, the amount of attention that's paid to targeted killing and drone strikes and the question of collateral damage, first of all, I think that the uh, debate over the civilian casualties is um, wildly misguided um, in these areas. I think that if you look at the studies that have been cited endlessly from, for example, NYU and Stanford law clinics, um, you need to take a look at, you know, they're very clear in stating in the introduction to those reports um, what their limitations were, but these are student advocacy clinics that are devoted to presenting one side of the story in an advocacy campaign. You never see that. All you ever see is it's the Stanford and NYU law schools. And the second feature of those things is that the studies that they conducted were um, arranged by an anti-drone campaigning organization, which paid the way for the witnesses that the anti-drone organization selected and brought down and conducted all of the translations. The students themselves that were doing this don't have the languages and were essentially dependent entirely. I mean, this is just not a serious way to approach yeah. social science. Um, the second thing about the general principle is, um, going to what it is you raised earlier, 
question of drone strikes is not a question of do we use drone strikes or does peace break out? Right? The question of drone strikes is a question of the means of warfare, and I would have assumed that the um, issue has got to be one of shouldn't you have a preference for picking the most precise weaponry that's available to you reasonably in the circumstances? The alternative in Pakistan that really has to be considered is not the question of drone strikes or nothing. It's a question of drone strikes or eventually the Pakistani army decides that it has to take on its own Taliban, as it is doing now. And I have not seen anything out there from these groups attempting to estimate the civilian casualties being caused by <laughs> massive bombing campaigns against entire villages, hundreds of thousands of refugees. I mean, we have an example of that from 2008, um, 2009, when the Taliban um, in Pakistan decided to, you know, sort of go for broke, and it goes, um, and eventually the Pakistani military responds, and it does so in the way that it is able to do, which is to level the entire area with rolling artillery barrages and airstrikes, and in that case, in that campaign, it wound up killing thousands of people, and it wound up leaving Como with somewhere close to a million people. So the question is not with regards to drone strikes, whether it's drone strikes or nothing. That's kind of the wrong hypothesis. The question is drone strikes or what other weapon do you plan to use? Uh, and if it's going to be artillery barrages, I'd say you made the wrong choice. <laughs> okay, Dr. Katani, let's go to you, please. Take, take the mic. Can you give the mic? I can be loud enough. Uh, Please, yes. Rashid Chitani, I'm with uh, uh, the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, this has been an excellent educational uh, program for me. Uh, tremendous insight on what's going on, different views. I want to bring you to another particular issue that's going on uh, in that particular region, and, and the region I'm talking about is Africa with the Ebola outbreak that's going on. And uh, as it's expanding, uh, and, and, and going from one country to another, and President Obama's uh, 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 commitment of 3,000 troops to West Africa. Now, how does that play into all that is going on over there? Because we actually will have troops on boots on ground in that particular region. <laughs> well, you just scared me to death. <laughs> well, as usual, I have a view on this. I, I, um, <laughs> I think it was a big mistake. Um, I mean, it's the the Pentagon is an extraordinarily seductive institution. I've I've heard Jamie Gorelick say it's it's the one all-purpose institution of the U.S. government, and um, I think he would have been much better off saying the military will transport uh, three thousand public health people, experts in disease, uh, it's doctors, nurses, etc., than soldiers. Um, I think it would have been a much better move. It would not have made, once again, the face of the United States, the armed forces. Hey, Nick, with would you have had, would you ordered the three thousand civilians out there? <laughs> As president of the United States and head of the public health service, absolutely. I don't think there are that many people available. Well, that's that's the problem. I mean, the the, the mistake here well, is it's not, not sending three thousand doctors anyway. The decision of this week, the mistake is the social decision over a long period of time to not have an adequate capability for responding to crises of this sort, other than the Department of Defense. That's right. The reason the Pentagon gets tasked with these various missions is because there's nobody else who's competent to undertake the logistics and the supporting uh, the, the, the material and the other kinds of capabilities. If we had built up a Department of State, a USAID, a public health corps that was capable of responding, then the president would be able to, uh, to allocate resources in a more rational way. I, I think it's a good point to, to <coughs> go on uh, General Gray. I, I would like to call your attention again to my mission is to, to send everybody book. home so they can have supper. <coughs> yeah, well, General, just if I may, just uh, call their attention to <coughs> the information about his extraordinary book about le leadership that uh, is in effect. I know it's pushing me away. Okay, General, <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> it took the mic away. <laughs> 
Okay. I, uh, of course, you're probably wondering why I'm here. Uh, I'm not a Mideastern expert like my friend Michael. Uh, I certainly am not a professor, uh, nor am I a lawyer. And of course, uh, I have been known in, in earlier days in the Pentagon as saying that we ought to, we ought to go through the Pentagon and, uh, and uh, remove half the lawyers in every other office and then go back and move one out of the other offices. Because, uh, but really because, as was mentioned, uh, too many times they say no instead of trying to help us solve a challenge. And that's what, uh, that's what the good lawyers do. But we've got a lot that uh, haven't learned that yet. But at any rate, it's uh, this has I think been tremendous and it's been educational certainly for for me as well. I think we should just uh, remember a few basic things here before we leave. One is that uh, you know we're still, regardless of uh, of popular opinion or the media or anyone else, we're still uh, the greatest country on earth, and uh, we're the greatest country on earth for a lot of really really good reasons. No other nation in the world has ever committed their precious resources, their people, their dollars uh, for the good of mankind or people kind like we have. And I think uh, within balance and uh, with all the things that we've done, we've tried to stick with the rules of the road, sort of the, the, the rule of law and the like. And it's not easy. Uh, I was at Panmunjom when our prisoners came home from Korea. Next month, 44 years ago, next month, on the 15th of October, I saw uh, terrorism firsthand with the Viet Cong. I saw a 11-year-old girl come up to us in a rice paddy in south of Da Nang, screaming and crying. Her father had been a village chief pro-South Vietnamese, and he had been assassinated the night before, and this little 11-year-old had her arms cut off at her elbows by the Viet Cong. That's terrorism of first degree, and sometimes you want a reprisal and, and do something, revenge, etc., right away. But we've got to kind of think that kind of thing through. We've got to remember that um, you're never going to defeat barbarism by being barbaric. We've got to have a higher, higher standard. We can't be like uh, the Germans, for example, in, as was mentioned in, uh, in Yugoslavia and elsewhere, uh, when they countered uh, uh, the resistance movement by beheading or, or, uh, or killing 25 or 30 or 200 uh, villagers and that kind of thing. That's not what we're all about. If we go back to that, uh, we've got, uh, we just are going to lose in the long run because we're going to lose everything we believe in. And so we've got to have some rules of law. And I think the, uh, the laws that we have, we've got to keep. And certainly we have to have some more of them now because we've got a new situation, a new generation of people, new challenges and all that kind of thing. In terms of a strategy and all that, we must remember that uh, it's the end state that you have to decide upon first. What do you want to look like five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it is? How do you want it to turn out? And any kind of strategy's got to be adaptive and all of that. And in the campaign plan, after you do that, you've got to make sure in your end state, you've got to look at the consequences of your potential actions before you take them. And the consequences are both in the short term, the mid term, and the long term. Uh, some of these challenges have been around a long time. Terrorism, uh, it, it, terrorism is a tactic, and it's been around, as you know, it's in the Bible, it's in the Quran. You know, we, we had many terrorist-type tactics in the, in the Revolutionary War. Oh, just read about uh, marrying a swamp fox and what happened in the Carolinas and the like. So we want to get carried away with what this is. And, and the term global war on terrorism, in my humble opinion, is wrong. And it always has been. Uh, and we shouldn't uh, try to, uh, to uh, uh, defeat or hurt al-Qaeda by running around killing leaders. They, only, they just bring more leaders. And all we do is make martyrs out of these people. So there's a lot of things that we gotta, we've got to learn about this or relearn, as the case may be. And uh, the, uh, you're not going uh, to severely limit the Islamic uh, State 
thing by uh, by running them out of Iraq because they're based in Syria. So you want to think about these things. And uh, you still have uh, the Sunni and the Shiite relationship. You still have them uh, killing each other and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Uh, the terrorism and that was alluded to in Pakistan and 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 the uh, the uh, damage that was done in Pakistan here just a moment ago and that goes back uh, hundreds of years that goes back to India and the terrorist movement and the one lobby movement in there that's where the Taliban uh, got their start in Pakistan and the like and they're still there so I mean so we need to understand our history we understand what this is all about, and uh, and we have to prepare for the long haul. But above all, uh, I hope that we uh, don't step away from our values, our standards, what makes us different, what makes us unique, and uh, and and remember that it's any strategy is uh, the least of all is the military part. That we can do. It's the political will, it's the economic idea, it's societal implications, it's technology to some degree, it's all those kind of things. And then finally, I would hope that we, uh, we create generations of young Americans who are better at looking at the world and at people through their eyes instead of our eyes. We, uh, the old timers like us, we don't do that very well. And as I've used the example many times, when I was uh, on my last tour of duty in the uh, late 80s, uh, uh, every year we had a flap in Haiti. And every year we'd go to sea, and every year we'd steam around in ever-diminishing circles, and every year some Phi Beta Kappa, wasn't a lawyer, at, uh, in the joint staff would uh, come out with a message saying, we're going to drop leaflets. And every year I'd go back as the commander of the forces in the Atlantic and say, great idea, but they can't read. Uh, so fine. <laughs> See what I mean? So we, we've got to understand uh, what this is all about. Thank you all very much. It's been a great day.